So um, let's go ahead and, and I'd like to introduce our, uh, our presenters for today. We have Bhagya Subrayan. Uh, Bhagya is, uh, is an astrophysicist and uh, is doing work with one of our faculty at Purdue. Uh, her primary research is in um, supernova. And so Bhagya is with us and we also have Jack Reynolds uh, Jack is also an astrophysicist, and, uh, and he also works in the same research group. So, um, Jack, Bhagya, I'm going to hand it over to you, and let's go ahead and get started. Rather than this being a presentation, I would like this to be more interactive in the sense that uh, we will talk about things, we will enjoy seeing them on Stellarium, we will know what you experience with Stellarium, and then uh, go from there. Before that, I want to share a tiny bit of uh, my uh, interest, how I came to uh, astronomy or astrophysics, a small like introduction of myself. So when I was a kid like you guys, um, uh, I was uh, uh, very curious about twilight. I did not understand twilight like properly. I knew that the sun was set, but I did not know why, why there was still light, like in the sense that uh, some days it was too much, some days it was not bright. So I was uh, very curious about that. And then I asked my parents and one day my mom told me that it's because of something bright in the sky called moon. And so my first uh, curious object or, or something which started off uh, me to astronomy was moon. And it's, it's still my favorite, but uh, um, one among my favorites because I ended up learning more and more and more and got, getting interested in more and more. So, um, and then as I grew up, like, uh, I learned in textbooks about the sizes of planets, our solar system, everything, but my little brain did not understand why I'm not able to see them in night sky. Like why am I not able to see the giant size of Jupiter in night sky? Little did I know that this, these were very far from me and I was not able to understand the scale of the universe by myself at that age. But then uh, the curiosity built up and then I started learning stars and now I'm learning death of stars, which are massive solar explo uh, uh, stellar explosions called supernova. Yeah, so like moon is one of my favorite objects and it's always my very cutest object. Yeah. Jack, do you want to share a story? A little one, just to get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, my background with the uh, astrophysics research team here at Purdue is mainly working with uh, data science and transient mechanics. So we're, we're all preparing for a really big telescope that goes live either later this year or early next year called Van Ruben Observatory that's going to change the face of astronomy. But in my spare time, I do amateur astrophotography. So I've got my own little, tiny little imaging telescope. And my first night out, I was just about an hour south of West Lafayette. And I took the picture behind me of the Milky Way at Shade State Park. So if you're in Indiana, it's a, it's a spot I'd highly recommend. You can see some beautiful skies. If not, pop on a uh, dark sky map on the internet and you know see what's nearby you. And just go out and look at the stars. I, Sometimes you forget how many of them there are just by looking up in the city. So it's, it's something I consider worthwhile. Great. Okay, uh, now diving into uh, what we think, what we'll be doing today. Before that, I uh, wanted to ask you guys, did you find the lesson interesting, the uh, YouTube video that we uploaded? Did you go through that? Uh, did you play, have some experience playing around with Stellarium? Did you have any questions that came up when you were uh, learning the software or trying to understand what we were uh, trying to say through the video? Uh, can someone, uh, someone share an experience of, or were there any problems with the installation or anything? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Drew. Uh, pardon me if I uh, not uh, pronounce your name correct and you can uh, always feel free to correct me. Yeah, go No, ahead. you got it right. Um, oh, nice. uh, when I did it, like, in the video, you had like the bar at the bottom and on the side. Yes. I can use the bar at the bottom, but I can't see it. And I can't use the bar at the side. It'll pop up with like the, uh, what it, what the options are, but I can't see it. And I think any windows that open, they're there, but they're invisible. Um, okay. So one troubleshooting method for that, and you can try that right now with me, I can share my screen uh, and then uh, we can, yeah, this is what I want, like uh, ask questions and then we can troubleshoot it together. What do you guys say? Uh, can you see my Stellarium screen? Yeah. Okay, so you are having trouble. Okay, at, at the present, we won't see any uh, toggling bars on the sides or at the bottom, right? 
Now you have to keep your cursor like at the side and then play around with these. Uh, like it yeah. just it, it just takes some time. Like now it just goes away. So if 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 you keep your cursor for some time there, uh, then it would start showing up and then it would be more stable. Is that what your question was? Well, like so on the bottom bar, I can see like if I hover over where like the constellation lines would be, I can press it and it'll show up. But I can't see like the physical image on the sidebar or the bottom bar. The, si the bottom bar, it works. I just can't see it. And the sidebar, I can't do anything. Like the help window won't open or I can't have you use tried, the um, bar. Have you tried reinstalling it? And what operating system are you on? I did try reinstalling it and it didn't help. And then I think it's Microsoft. Yeah, if you're on a Windows computer. OK. Yeah. Um, can you access the uh, configuration window? It would be in the left-hand toolbar. I can't do anything. So, like, I think it opens the window. I just can't see it because, like, earlier when I was messing around with it, I was trying to click a planet, but it wouldn't do anything. And then I kind of moved my mouse around, and it acted like there was a window there. And I kind of shrunk the window, and it let me click the planets again. So I think the window's there. It's just invisible. Have you tried exiting full screen mode? It's on the bottom bar. Uh, Oh, okay. I can show show the uh, yeah it's, yeah okay sure. Like I use Mac. That's the reason why this problem did not happen to me. But this is okay. Where is it? Okay. So if I there is a full screen mode session. Yeah. So this is the full screen mode. So F eleven. If you press or like now it, it in my I mean I know I'm sharing this window, but in my like. It, uh, it's full screen now, but if I click it again, yeah. it goes back to the like normal size in my. Yeah. Can you, uh, are you trying it right now? And then can you try it once more and see if that's working or not for you? Um, yeah, let me just, I still can't see anything. It like brings up like, it'll show like the text with the options and stuff, but it doesn't actually let me do anything on the left hand toolbar thing. Uh, have you tried the web version then? So um, if nothing works out with the, okay. So if if the installation is bad, everything is bad, like uh, your system mm -hmm. is not working as it thinks it should be working. Uh, one other thing we can, we, which you can do is like uh, go, go to the web version. Jack, if you, if you can share your screen and just show them the web version, that would be great. Like, uh, yeah. So okay. this is the web version. Um, for navigation, the search bar is up here. And with that, you should be able to, generally speaking, be able to follow along with everything else. OK, thank you. So, sorry that's not working. Great. So that was a first question for the day. Now, uh, I'm pretty sure other, uh, other people who would have questions too about um, the assignments we gave. Did anyone try to come up or solve the challenges we gave in the uh, video last uh, on the last lesson, or even in the email that uh, uh, Dave sent for us, there were uh, quite some challenges and anyone was brave enough for the challenges or did you find any other troubles? Just shoot questions. Daniel, I see you said you did one. Do you want to share what you did? Um, I did uh, the dwarf planet one. I did Hamaya. I don't think I pronounced that right, but it's a dwarf planet that's spinning super fast, so it makes it the shape of it in oval. Wow, that's really interesting. I'd not actually heard of that. Yeah, that's new to me too. Like the new dwarf planet. Okay, I'll go ahead and check that today. That's something today I'm learning from you guys. <laughs> Lily, did you try anything? Yeah, um, one thing I was checking out was like, looking at the constellations and trying to learn them um, because I don't really know all of them. And also I was like learning the star names and also like reading all of the info on each of the stars for the constellations. I thought that was really cool. Like how Polaris is like um, a pulsating star, I believe, and like a rotating of two. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, no, it's that's something that surprised me in astronomy was, you know, you look at the sky and you think, look at all those stars. And really, you're, you're seeing 
almost twice as many stars as you think because so many stars are binary systems, which is fascinating to me that I, I think it's actually more common to have a binary system than just a single star, which makes, uh, I guess, our solar system an outlier, really, which is rather wild. Yeah. All happened. <laughs> the sun was just the sun. <laughs> there was no companion to it. And then we are surviving here, right? Okay. So uh, speaking about Polaris, I had something uh, cool to show about um, our constellations in general. But before that, I just want to throw out the questions that how many of you are aware of circumpolar constellations? Do you uh, know what circumpolar constellations are? Or uh, like, uh, have you heard that term before? Um, yes, no? Just say yes or no, somebody. It's OK. I didn't know what circumpolar constellations were until I started astrophotography. So. No, no. So OK. No, no, no. OK, that's great. So uh, somebody says uh, constellations around the polar line. Uh, okay, you're reaching there, getting there, but let's, we'll, we'll see and visualize it. But uh, answer if you could, uh, have you ever seen um, uh, Polaris not in the night sky when you're looking from the Northern Hemisphere? Like you know, the first thing you go out in the night and see is like, where is Polaris? Where, where is the North Star? Have you ever seen that star set? Uh, yes, no? Or how many of you know about the Big Dipper? like the seven uh, stars, the Big Dipper. Yes, I think I, I'm, I'm seeing nodding heads like, yeah, uh, we know about the Big Dipper. So whenever you go out in the ni night sky uh, in, always see, always see, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I like this. So you you guys are responding in chat rather than, okay, that, that's great. So you always see, it. you don't see it set or rise uh, whole throughout the year, right? Like uh, you don't see that constellations, uh, uh, you, you see all the time, uh, them all the time. Now I'm going to show the same with Stellarium and actually show the motions of these stars. So those stars which never set or rise um, and always uh, have their motions with respect to the Northern star. So they appear to be, they appear to be like circling around the Northern star. And I'll take the step by step because I'm, I, I know that you guys are new to Stellarium. Uh, and then if I go as fast as this, so, okay. Just stop me and, and ask me questions if one of the instructions, one of the things I do here is not clear to you guys. Okay, so now, okay. So this is set at West Lafayette and at this time. Now I want to go ahead in time and make it like um, 5 p.m. Uh, no, no, night today. So I'm going forward in time and this is date and time, I want it in like sensible uh, units, like uh, hours day. So now it's 11 o'clock here, 11.20. So now I'm going, uh, 16 is four o'clock and then now I am, it's setting. So you guys follow me, just give a heads up. Are you guys following me, just nods? I can't see the chat at the same time, okay, good. So now we are going ahead, ahead, ahead. Okay, now it's around nine o'clock, right? So now, I'm good with the date and I'm good with the time. So I don't want this window anymore. And then I'm just, now I'm zooming out. This is zooming in. I'm just scrolling my mouse, like the button in the mouse. So I'm just uh, zooming in so that it's uh, going in and now I'm zooming out. So I'm keeping on zooming out. This is for my, uh, and this is just pressing the screen and then just tilting. So why why am I doing this? I want to show, show you guys some uh, constellations which never, uh, set or never rise. So, so far good from this. So uh, it's just now, now this is just like a sky chart you guys uh, see, right? So how many of you guys have just at least one time saw a sky chart? So this is what night would look uh, if you look above in a sky chart. Yes, no? Okay, good. Now what I want to show you guys is that um, I want to, uh, slowly go fast, go ahead in time. So I'm just clicking this just to show that some uh, constellations are going to orbit uh, around the northern sky. So, okay, I know where the Polaris is, but I, so this is the Polaris. No, sorry, that's a dark nebula. Okay, I'm lost. That's that's, that's the, the little, little dipper. dipper. That's the little dipper. Okay, like 
Okay. You know what? I can search Polaris. Hmm, I'm smarter than this. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so now I'm going to fast forward in time. So what do you, what I want you guys to uh, focus is over these constellations here. So look at Cassiopeia, look at, I, I'm not too late, let's see. Look at Cassiopeia, look at, um, where is Big Dipper? Okay, so Big Dipper is a part of, is seven stars of another bigger constellation called Ursa Major. That's why Big Dipper is a common name that we call, but uh, Ursa Major is a, a constellation which it belongs to. Now I'm going to fast forward in time and this teeny bit of lesson. Okay, what do you see? Tell me what do you see? Somebody. Ursa Major is staying still. Sorry? Polaris is staying still. Okay. Polaris is the star, okay. Now look at this constellation, this constellation, this constellation, this constellation. I mean, I'm just like, my screen is a little, okay. So what about uh, Ursa Major? Oh, no, no, I don't want to be morning. All the stars will be gone. Okay, so I'm just, you know what? I can just remove the atmosphere. Okay. What do you think, what do you see? So look at uh, Draco, Big Dipper is this, so this is Big Dipper, right? So you see Big Dipper, but Ursa Major is another concept. So what about Big Dipper? Does Big Dipper set? Like, or is it's like going uh, around the Polaris all the time? Are you guys able to see that? If, if you look at this constellation? Yes, no? Or you should have questions if you don't uh, like, um, not following what I'm trying to say. So these constellations, so if you, okay, Jack, what do you think uh, you will see when you uh, have a very long exposure uh, with your camera for circumstellar, uh, circum, circum stellar star, circumpolar stars or a circumpolar constellations? Yeah, okay. as long as you're pointing uh, roughly north with a camera, and you can do this with any camera that you can set a long exposure on. So if you have a point and shoot at home, you can set it for a minute or two, and you'll be able to do this too, is you'll actually see the star trail start to form a circle around roughly where Polaris is. So better idea would be I associate a little coordinates with that. Now, what do you see? So this is, imagine you are inside a whole big sphere, and then you are rotate, uh, so this is, and this is the like North Pole. And then you are keeping on rotating that sphere. You always see the top constellations in the sphere, like light at the spot and you don't see them rise and set. Is that concept, I mean, like that is more um, intuitive to you guys or no? Yes. Okay, so that was my little lesson on uh, circumpolar cons uh, constellations. So next time when somebody asks you, Hey, have you heard about circumpolar? And there is this uh, term uh, within itself. So circumpolar is can be divided to two, circum and polar. So things which are orbiting uh, or things which are moving around the pole, that's circumpolar. Like if that is easy to remember, a small like um, uh, memory hack. So something like that. You have questions? You should have questions. Okay, no worry. So uh, we we know that Earth has uh, Earth rotates. We have uh, around itself around its own pole, and the pole is a little tilted. So we it's not just rotating like this. It's only rotating with an angle in there. Uh, so if this is uh, the straight axis, and if this is the this would be the axis of the Earth. So it's because that there is an axis in the there is a tilt in our uh, polar axis and Earth is rotating. That's what that's the reason why we have circumpolar constants. Uh, Zainan asked a really, sorry if I butchered the name, that's a really interesting question. Is there a limit to what constellations are circumpolar? And the answer to that is it's actually different depending on where you are on Earth. So here in West Lafayette, we're at roughly, I'm going to get this mixed up with my home, but 42 degrees latitude. So based off of how high or low you are on the globe, it'll change what constellation is circumpolar. Okay. So for example, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you're going to see a totally different starscape, but it's still going to rotate in a circle around the axis of rotation. So in the southern hemisphere, instead of Polaris, what they use is called the Southern Triangle, which is a, 
coordination of three stars to tell you where this uh, rotation is. Two questions related to this. Just, just with the point that Z Jack said right now, will you be able to see North Star in the Southern Hemisphere? That's just a stupid question by me, but will you be able to see a Northern Star in the Southern Hemisphere? Yes, no? Like something? No? no? Great, yeah. There is no uh, like a pole star or like Southern pole star. It's just a constellation instead, uh, which is called the Southern Cross that Jack uh, mentioned right now. Um, and that brings to the other point that it is very different on how you view the night sky depending upon where you are on earth, which means that a different, if you, if you go, okay, so here is a little exercise uh, to follow up if you guys are interested, go to different uh, latitudes, like go, uh, look from where you are right now, look to the other northern, um, if, if you're in the northern, go to the southern hem some place in the southern hemisphere, and then check the night sky and the uh, circumpolar constellations, and also check on some place at equator. And uh, uh, if you can email me, or if you can email Dave, how many circumpolar constellations you, you saw on uh, equator, that would be great. That's a like, like, little uh, quick exercise that you can check by yourself. Right. So Stellarium offers you a lot of really cool tools to see what's in the night sky. So you can go out in your backyard and I can tell what constellation that is. I know where the center of rotation is for the stars. But one of the things Stellarium can do for you that the night sky can't anymore is show you the things you can't see with the naked eye. So a lot of my focus is on objects that require two or three minutes of exposure from a camera to see. Fortunately, with Stellarium, you guys can go explore that part of the sky without having to have the equipment that I do. So if you're following along, the deep sky, oh, no, I can share my screen, actually. There we go. That's a better idea. The deep sky toggle is down here next to the planets. And when you toggle that, you're going to see a lot of different types of objects pop up. So all of these colors and symbols mean something. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy, galaxies are going to come up as red circles. Star clusters are going to come up as yellow collections of dots, and um, nebula are going to come up with dots with a box around them. So that's going to help you identify what kind of objects you're looking at in the night sky. But probably my favorite part of Stellarium, which I mentioned in the video, is that a lot of these objects have color pictures that amateurs or the Hubble Space Telescope have processed. So Before, they're... Uh, yeah, sorry, Jack, to interrupt you, but um, how many of you tried looking at some cool DSO object in the night sky with Stellarium if you uh, had already installed? I'm sorry about that, but if you had uh, already installed anything. Um, did anyone try? Like, yeah. did you try any um, deep sky object, zooming into any deep sky object? Yeah, if, if anyone has one they found that they're interested in, I'd be happy to, you know, search it and we can talk about actually what it causes its composition, its colors, uh, a little bit about how it would be photographed, things like that. I look at a star cluster. I don't remember its name though. Okay, no, let's pick a star cluster and we can investigate that. So this is a star cluster called Caroline's Rose Cluster. I picked it off the top of my head and it looks to be an open star cluster, meaning it is loosely bound together, not so densely packed and more importantly it lacks nebulosity so it's just a collection of stars so if you were able to see this in the night sky what it would look like it's kind of like a fuzzy puffball and that's that's something really interesting to look at but it's something that's hard to spot so for those of you in the northern hemisphere i'm going to point out something that's a little easier to spot uh, one of the few objects you're going to be able to see just by walking out in your backyard uh, as long as you picked it out in Stellarium first, and that's Pleiades, uh, commonly known as the Seven Sisters. This star cluster right here is absolutely gorgeous to photograph, and it's one of the first targets that Amaterasu photographers pick out. But more importantly, it's one of the few targets in the night sky you can see with the naked eye. So you can actually go out in your backyard, especially during the month of November, and you'll see these, this collection of stars, and you'll see how it's fuzzy. It's just a little different than everything in the sky. So I highly recommend that you, you keep this in the back of your mind. Uh, it's still barely visible this time of year, 
but certainly later in the year, I, I'd recommend going out and seeing it. One of the tricks that we talk about in observational astronomy is using the cones and the rods of your eyes differently. So your eyes have color receptors and they also have black and white receptors. The black and white receptors are much, much, much more sensitive. So if you use those to observe stars and star clusters, you're gonna be able to see it in a lot more detail. So the way you do that is instead of looking straight at Pleiades, you wanna place it just in the side of your vision, right in your peripherals. And that way you can see a lot more stars. So I recommend to go out, count how many stars you can see, and then go online and see how, uh, how many stars other people have found. It's a really interesting exercise and it's, it's one of the pieces of uh, observing that can really get you into observational astronomy. How many of you knew this trick of peripheral vision? So instead of looking like this, you look like this. How, how, how many of you knew that? Like you just, you just try to use the, like, because the, the um, uh, color uh, cells or color receptor cells are like right in the middle of uh, our retina, but the other, the black and white sensitive cells, rods and cones, I always confuse them, which, is, which one is rods and which one is cones, but pardon me. But uh, the uh, receptor cells, which are uh, like black and white, uh, or which were more sensitive to black and uh, white, th those are towards the peripheral, like uh, to, uh, towards the sides of our uh, retina. And that's the reason why we like squint, uh, like try to look with the peripheral vision. So um, um, that was really, um, like eye-opening to me when I was going for uh, looking at stars in the night sky because I one thing you your eyes needs to get dark adapted like you have to stay in the uh, like uh, night sky for some time so that you're able to actually see start seeing the stars that's that's called the adaption to the dark light mm -hmm. and then uh, the added advantage with the peripheral vision is that you will be able to be more sensitive to the light coming in yeah dark adaptation can take up to 30 minutes for some people so I know it's cold in November, put a coat on first. You know, this may not be a quick trip out to the porch. It might be a little longer than that. Or if it's warm where you are in November, good for you, honestly. <laughs> but Jack, I have a question before you go on. Just uh, okay. in case uh, anybody wants to find the Pleiades, uh, is that, uh, that's in Orion, is that correct? Pleiades is? In Taurus. So yes. it's in Taurus. In Taurus, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I, in the winter months, at least in Indiana, it will be almost directly overhead around 11 o'clock in November. So that's, that's your sweet spot for seeing it. The first time I photographed it was actually because I kept seeing it and it kept bothering me that I wasn't pointed at that instead of whatever I was going after that night. What, about, know, what about in February? Is it still overhead? It's not directly overhead. It's a little harder to spot. So if you've got a tall tree line near you, it's going to be difficult or a tall cityscape. But if you have a, a flat field that you're working with, that you're standing in, you should be able to see it still lower on the horizon. Um, shouldn't be much more than 15 or 20 degrees. Oh. Okay, uh, well, yeah, students well, can find it in, in Stellarium and then go out and try and find it in the real sky. Yeah. Give it a shot. Half of the half the challenge of astrophotography is actually finding the target. So, <laughs> I have a quick tip. So it's called the bull. So uh, if you if you look at the if you uh, uh, pull up the art constellation art, it's called the bull. So uh, if you can try looking for a V shape. So if you can like um, not have the grid lines, it's, it it would be more uh, easier for that. So it's a V shaped. Um, I mean. No, the stellarium art and the uh, no grid lines. So I'm just helping out if they want to look at the night sky with, for Taurus. No, 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 I can take it if you want. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. So if we enable the constellation, I forgot I was sharing screen. Okay, um. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there, so, okay. So that's the Taurus constellation. I can, yeah, you know what? I can annotate. So, oh, yeah. so see, so it, it, it's a V-shaped constant. So this is bull's eye and these are the horns. So that's why I always teach the students, like you always uh, look for, and this should be, okay. So you look, so this is how I teach the students. Uh, you go to Polaris, you know where Polaris is, and then uh, try to look for Cassiopeia and 
Cassiopeia is the w, w star, the W constellations. You look for a W in the night sky, and this would be in the direction opposite to um, Big Dipper. So where, where you see Big Dipper, look at the opposite direction. If you're looking at Big Dipper in the east, or look at look to the west to, to, see, to see this W constellation, and then try to spot this uh, V with the horns. Like these two stars are the horns. I always call them the horns of the bull. And then uh, this is the bull's eye, and that's the brightest star. Uh, in uh, if I'm not wrong, no. Yeah, Aldebaran is the brightest star in Taurus constellation. So, and then look for this uh, bull shaped. That's that's my hack to see Taurus in the night sky. But that's a very like it can work. It may work but it's worth trying to just spot Taurus constellation. Yep. Okay, I'm just gonna clear everything, <laughs> clear my drawings. Were you guys able to see my drawings? Okay, cool, okay. So one other thing you can do in Suarin that's really nice, because they have the pictures, we can talk a little bit about the science of nebula, planetary nebula, and supernova remnants. So I'm gonna use the search feature for this so I don't you know, flounder around trying to find everything. And I have a little list of good targets to explain some of these things on. So your most common color in deep sky objects is going to be red. And that red is corresponding to the H alpha emission, which is your first ionization state of hydrogen. So if you think of hydrogen gas, and then you hit it with lots of electrons and energy, you ionize it, it's going to emit that red color. So if we zoom in here on the heart and soul nebula, which is just a beautiful wide field nebula, to put in perspective the angular size, so if we could see this in the night sky, how big it would be, it would be roughly two moons wide, each of these nebula. So together, you could fit four moons across right here. So the heart and soul nebula are uh, clusters, so star clusters associated with nebulosity. And the, that nebulosity is either a remnant of or still is a star forming region. So if you've ever seen the Pillars of Creation picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, this would be something very similar to that. And this red, you see this very deep, beautiful red, is your hydrogen emission. So it's lots of very simple gas that's very energetic. Whereas if we go over to the Sol Nebula, you'll notice you've got that strong red emission, but you've also got this blue emission. And if you look very closely, you've got some yellow in here. Now, an important point of looking at photographs like these that aren't labeled per se, is that the colors used by amateur astrophotographers are entirely subjective. I can go and take a picture of Andromeda and I could say, I think all of the helium emission that you see deep in the, deep in the center of Andromeda should be purple. That's, that's my prerogative. Generally speaking though, it's agreed upon that there are certain things that are certain colors. Um, typically you'll see your oxygen three as this blue color, which is a third excited state of oxygen, so very, very energetic oxygen. And then often in the center of nebula, you'll get this yellow color, which corresponds to helium. And the reason that you only see the helium in the center, because the helium is all over, is that helium is very difficult to excite, so it's very difficult to get an emission off of. So that yellow color is your helium, the blue is your oxygen. And that's the heart and soul nebula. So those are clusters associated with nebulosity. But there's also other types of objects. So we can look for supernova remnants. So hey, Jack. let's go. Yeah. Jack, I've got a, a question. So, you know, I'm thinking about 4th of July and the fireworks and, and those colors coming from uh, atoms of certain elements in the excited state. So when you're looking at nebula, you talk about oxygen and hydrogen ex as excited atoms. We're really kind of looking at fireworks in the sky, aren't we? Yeah. So with, with fireworks, you burn things like magnesium, which is very reactive. So if you guys ever get your hands on a piece of magnesium, be very careful with it because it will just spontaneously combust if you're, if you're eh, not spontaneously, but if you're not careful with it, it can definitely catch on fire. And you'll notice it'll burn a really bright, deep yellow orange color, which is spectacular for fireworks. So yeah, you can think of these gas states, these gas emissions, as really energetic firework material that requires much, much, much more energy than we would normally see. Jack, I've got another question. Yeah. When you say the heart and soul nebula is the equivalent in size of like four moons across, 
I'm thinking of standing out in the yard and holding my thumb up and saying that, uh, you know, at arm's length, my thumb is about, it about covers the moon. And if I want to then say that the heart and soul uh, nebula would be the equivalent of four moons, that would be like having a width of four thumbs across the sky? Yeah. So the oh, way that you can incredible. tell that in Scolarium is you look at the angular size. So over here, you'll see a size metric. So the heart nebula is roughly one degree across. And the soul nebula is also roughly roughly one degree across. It's a little smaller. So there are 40 arc minutes, which is this measurement right here. And there are 60 arc minutes in one degree. So yeah, between all of them, you could fit about four thumbs across, which is it's quite staggering, really, when you think about it. There's something so massive in our sky that we we have no ideas there. If we take Andromeda, it's um it's three thumbs across by two thumbs. So you could fit six thumbs in it, which is, I mean, that's a truly staggeringly large object that's remarkably close to us. Uh, Jack, there was a question that's, that's in the chat. Is the color in the nebula, um, is that similar to the color of aurora? That's a really good question. So aurora are an electromagnetic phenomena. So it's it's similar, but just a tad lower energy. So I, I think it would be accurate to say aurora are emissions from ionization states because you have low density gas in the upper atmosphere that's bombarded by solar radiation and that causes that gas to emit. The same thing is happening in nebula, except it's bombarded by thousands of stars densely packed in a region. Oh, how they get their name. Yeah, so the constellations have a lot of history behind their names. Uh, lots of that is rooted in uh, Greek or Roman mythology or Native American folklore, at least in the constellations we use, the names we use in North America. Believe it or not, the constellation names are not used the same everywhere. So uh, as far as I understand, the Chinese have their own constellation names, which I'm not as familiar with, but are totally different. Their night sky is also very different than ours. So it's it's deeply rooted in history. As for the nebula, the nebula were often named off of kind of what they looked like. So when observers were looking at these nebula with the naked eye, just through a telescope, they would say, yeah, that kind of looks like, a, in this case, a crab. And the reason they chose a crab was because they thought it had an elliptical shape, kind of like a like a sphere that's been spun way too fast, a pizza dough. We, we know that oh, that's not the case. So there was a, a piece just done by our group that imaged the Crab Nebula in three dimensions, which is very neat if you want to look up the reconstructions of that. We now know that the Crab Nebula has more of a, a heart shape in some of its emission lines. So. That's, you know, there's there's a lot of history behind the names. Uh, or you can just do what the astronomers do and say NGC 1952. Uh, that's the that's the name you'd see referred to in papers a lot. But most of the time when we're talking, we just call it by the common name, which would be Crab Nebula. Oh, that's a great one. So when uh, things get out of uh, control, like you have so many objects, they start making new, new catalogs. So NGC is a, NGC is a catalog. Uh, and then um, I don't know when uh, is the limit when they decide that, OK, this catalog is done. And then we are moving. Um, uh, here is another thing. So there are different catalogs for different objects. So there are catalogs for uh, galaxies. There are catalogs for uh, stars. There are catalogs for um, uh, stars in different uh, other wavelengths. So the, the, there could be some for uh, the stars which are bright in the infrared, uh, some for in the optical, and then uh, so uh, the naming convention is not as trivial as we think, but it started with the history of when our ancestors started writing them down uh, one by one as they saw in the night sky. So great question, great questions. I just put a link in the chat and people don't have to look at it now, you can look at it later. But it's an interesting website when we talk about the names of the constellations uh, being different across cultures. Many cultures have identified basically the same star patterns in the sky, 
related to a particularly bright spot, for example. And uh, and the link I posted gives a lot of uh, a lot of information about the constellations across thirty or forty different cultures. No, it's it's really amazing how many things cultures have in common uh, when we look up at the sky. We've we've all kind of seen the same thing, uh, and what's remarkable to me is we've almost all drawn the same lines. So. Another type of object you'll see in Stellarium is supernova remnants. So you'll notice the Crab Nebula has a picture. A lot of supernova remnants are too small for amateur astrophotographers to get a hold of, but they are not too small for the Hubble Space Telescope to take pictures of. So uh, many of the objects in Stellarium, the images are made off of Hubble Space Telescope images, which means they are limited to about three colors typically. So when you look at the Crab Nebula, you'll see this red on the outside, and then you'll see this pale kind of bluish yellow on the inside. And that's because they didn't quite have enough color to truly illustrate all the contents of the object. Now, we have new measurements that do have those, but for the Stellarium image, it doesn't. On the outside, you see that red. Now, if the Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant, the supernova is an exploding star. The outside of that star is, generally speaking, going to be hydrogen, just like any other star. So it's a safe bet to assume that that is a hydrogen emission on the outside of red. And on the inside, you're going to have all the contents of the star, which are going to be helium, oxygen, all the way down to iron, probably, given that it exploded. That is going to be shown on the inside. Now, what's interesting about the emission on the inside of this nebula, you'll notice that typically nebula have pretty defined features. They're still fuzzy, but they have pretty high definition. So you see the hydrogen alpha is pretty well defined in these threads throughout it. Whereas on the inside, it's all very fuzzy and jumbly. And that's because inside of the Crab Nebula, there is a pulsating, I might say this wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's a pulsating neutron star that's constantly bombarding the inner shell of the supernova remnant with high energy particles. And that causes an enormous amount of emission to come out of the center of the remnant. And that's what's left us with this very bright center in the Crab Nebula, which is absolutely gorgeous. So you can take uh, these colors, these identifiers, and you can go to just about any object in Stellarium that has a picture, and you can say something about it. So if we jump over here to the Elephant Trump Nebula, nebula you'll see it's a very large nebula. Well, it's not a massive nebula, but it's a large nebula. And it has the star forming regions right here that are heavily dense. And it's got the diffuse regions, mainly in hydrogen alpha, shown in the red, orange, and pink. There it's is just dust too. Yeah. So the darker regions, dust. You... Yeah. No, they're, they're dust. Yeah. So uh, mostly dust in the pictures, uh, especially in the colors which are using. Uh, comes out, they are cool uh, objects. So the dust is very cool. That's the reason why like, uh, it's in the darker colors uh, compared to the other regions. So, yeah. No, we, we asked you guys to uh, pick out a moon or a planetary object that you thought was interesting and have something you know, to say about it or questions about it. So if you guys had any of those that you found interesting or saw something you didn't quite understand, we'd love to hear about it. Stellarium, this is, this is something fun to note. Stellarium also has a mobile app. Now, mind you, I think it costs $5, but it allows you to point your phone at the sky and see where all these objects are. So there are a lot of apps that do that. I think of them, Stellarium is the most comprehensive. So, so Jack, how about, how about you pick out a, uh, uh, one of your favorite moons around one of the planets in our solar system and Find it, zoom in on it, and see what we can uh, find out. Yeah. So my favorite planet in the night sky is definitely Jupiter. And that's specifically because my first time trying to do astrophotography, what you have to do is polar align. You have to point all of your equipment at Polaris. So I pointed at, at the brightest thing in the sky, which is generally Polaris, but was not Polaris because I pointed at Jupiter, which was actually pointing south. So shame on me. 
<laughs> yeah, but, Jupiter is very bright. So sometimes we confuse planets with stars and then we think that it's stars, but it's actually they are planets. Mars yeah. is a giveaway because it's reddish. So, uh, yeah. My, my favorite moon, certainly Jupiter is Europa. Uh, if not just for the scientific interest in Europa and all of the amazing discoveries that have come out of it, but the fact that it looks up like a scratched up pool ball. There's just, <laughs> I, every time I look at it, I get a little laugh inside. Um, something really interesting about Jupiter though, is you'll notice that all of the planets form, or all of the planets, all of the moons of Jupiter form a line. And if we zoom in further, we'll get another one to pop up. If we come in a little further, we'll get a, a fourth one back there. You'll notice they all form a line. And that's a interesting observation because if you also look at the solar system, you'll notice everything forms a line there too, give or take. Uh, except, for, except for Pluto, Pluto's way out there. <laughs> Oh, oh, so we have uh, some uh, students sharing their um, uh, favorite dwarf planets or moons. So Danielle says that she did, uh, hu I mean, if I, Humia, Homi, I mean, I, I, I actually don't know this dwarf, dwarf planet, so I, I might be completely hey. mispronouncing this. Uh, Homea, I think. Homea, okay. Yeah. I don't see it coming up. But that could be an issue with the search feature. Um, let's check Triton, which is one of Neptune's moons. Yeah, Lily shares an interesting point. Like she uh, brings up the retrograde motion of Neptune's moon uh, Triton. Yeah. So there are a couple objects in the solar system that defy the norms. Triton is definitely one of them. Uh, and that in itself is kind of fascinating. So if you look Neptune here, you can almost see the rings around it, which is really awesome to see in Stellarium. And you'll notice that most of the moons look to be in plane with the ring. Triton does not, however. So. I'm sure there's some fascinating uh, collision science behind how that works. Let's check out this dwarf planet. H-A-U-M-E-A. Yeah, there you go. I think that's. I also can't spell, so that's, you know, an ongoing oh. issue for me. Wow, it's so tiny. <laughs> we do have an image of it though, which is awesome. Yeah. So to put in perspective how big this dwarf planet would be if we tried to observe it, the heart and soul nebula we looked at was about a degree wide, mm -hmm. about two degrees if you add them together. This one is less than 360 times smaller than that, which is, it's quite remarkable um, that we even found it in the first place. <laughs> Uh, again, and Jack, we've kind of used our hour, uh, but before we wrap up, I'd like to give anybody else a chance to ask a question that, that they may have thought of while, uh, while we've been playing around here. Does anybody have a question they'd like to throw out? Um, you mentioned how you do astrophotography. I'd love to hear kind of like a brief like um, process of like how that works and like how you use Stellarium to do that. Yeah. So Stellarium, as great of a planetarium software as it is, it actually has telescope control software built in. So I have a motorized telescope mount that I, I plug into my computer and Stellarium sends it the instructions to go to the target I want to find if I've set everything up right. Now, there are a lot of steps that come before that. I have to get everything pointed at Polaris. And I don't just mean generally at Polaris. It has to be dead on that slight offset from Polaris for all the equipment to function appropriately. And once I have that, the actual telescope mount will rotate with the sky so that when I take a picture, the stars don't, 
curve around Polaris. The whole telescope will curve around Polaris. Yeah, aligning is, is very important when you are doing astrophotography because uh, the night mm -hmm. sky is not constant. It, because we are rotating, uh, the Earth rotates in its own axis. Uh, we, um, it's actually the Earth rotating, but we see <laughs> the other way. <laughs> like, so to put in perspective what I do with my telescope, I can actually go over to the Heart and Soul Nebula again. I can click on this button, which will, I've set my equipment into this bar over here with Stellarium. And I can look at exactly how my telescope would frame this object. So the way I have it set up right now with my camera and my telescope, I cannot fit both the Heart and Soul Nebula in the frame. However, if I switch to a different camera, I don't have this camera, unfortunately. Now I can easily fit them both in the frame. Yeah. But I have to consider how nice the objects will look. So down here we have how many arc seconds, so how many degrees effectively I get per pixel. Mm -hmm. And the larger the degrees per pixel, the lower quality the image will be when I zoom in on it. Whereas if I use this camera, I could take multiple pictures and combine them all together later to get a really high quality picture. So that's some of the, that's some of the things that go through my mind and some of the things I use Stellarium for to coordinate my astrophotography efforts. Uh, Jack, do you want to uh, stop sharing your screen and we'll we'll come back to uh, full view here? Um, it's uh, twelve oh five. I think we should probably wrap up. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank. Jack and Bagia for their presentation. Uh, it's been very informative and I know they put a lot of work into thinking about what to talk about. And uh, so thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any anything else they would like to add or ask uh, before we sign off? I have something that, uh, that I would like to ask you all to do. And that is, I, I've got a, a little survey about the things we've done in, in SMAP and Saturday Morning Astro. And I'd like to get some feedback from you all to, uh, uh, to help guide us in what we do in the future and things we might wanna consider. So I'm going to post that in the chat. And if, uh, if I could ask you to uh, respond to that when we're done, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, well, Thank you for coming to our February Saturday morning astro. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something. Uh, I think I did. So thanks, Jack and Bagya. Uh, and thank you all for attending. We will see you next time when we talk about Kepler's laws and the motions of planets and comets. So until then, you've been smapped. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you joining.